So I'm not Chris. Uh, I'm just going to do a wee introduction. But um, thank you, Deidre. That was that was fantastic and uh, very interesting. Uh, I never put much credence in tarot cards before, but me as the fool was a hundred percent. Couldn't be more accurate. Uh, just glad my mother's not here because she'd have me dragged down to confessions. Um, so our next speaker is Chris Morris. Uh, so Chris is from Dundee over in Scotland. Um, I actually came across his writing on Readsy before. I joined the Blue Marble group and I loved it then and I still love his writing now. He's a fantastic writer. Um, it's been amazing to see his growth over the last, what's that, two years now since uh, since I, I've joined. Um, he, he's a regular in the Writers Magazine. He, he writes in a, a variety of, of different genres. Um, he has finished his first draft of his first children's chapter book and is now planning to move on to, to a bit more adult uh, novel direction. Um, please give a big hand for Chris Morse. Hello. Thanks very much, Sean. I'll give you 20 euros for that introduction as agreed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly nervous to be here today um, for a few reasons. Um, first of all, because we've got esteemed writers speaking today. Um, people who have won pretty big awards. I've not won any big awards, but I did come forth once in NYC midnight. And I, I've not stopped bragging about it since, and I'll mention it every chance I get. Fourth place. Um, but I'm also nervous because I know a lot of the writers um, today, um, and I've known them for the last couple of years, like Sean, um, and I've seen how they've all um, expanded and grown as well. And I've got a better uh, writer because of them. Uh, the Blue Marble group is just really fantastic. Um, so I want to say thanks to, to Deidre and to Russell um, for organising the Blue Marble group. And um, I think I said Blue Marble there. Blue Marble, sorry. Um, and for encouraging all of us all the time and for being there and for being supportive. It's really a, it's a tremendous uh, group. Um, so when Deidre asked me to speak today, the uh, answer was obvious. Absolutely no way. <laughs> Um, I had no idea what I was going to talk about, and I thought long and hard about it. Um, what am I supposed to say about uh, writing with beautiful language when we have Rial Rosehill here who writes beautifully in a language that she had to learn as a foreign language? What can I say about writing with character and voice when Sean McNichol is here and he, uh, with a couple of paragraphs, uh, his voice just tells you exactly who the character is and you feel like you know the character. What can I say about writing with wit when we've got Deidre Wit? Lovegren, who's made, lo, yeah, I'm messing up. It is Lovegren, isn't it? Yeah. Lovegren. I don't think I've ever said it out loud. I think that's what's um, thrown me there. Middle name is literally wit um, and comes across in the writing as well. Um, so I finally decided that um, all I can do is give you my own experience of writing and what I think has maybe made me a little bit better um, over the last little while. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of my um, uh, pieces um, that I've written. So one piece um, that the thing I'm going to talk about is quite apparent and another piece where this thing was happening and I didn't realise it was happening. But it all comes down to some pretty basic writing advice. So I bet you're glad you didn't pay for this conference. We told some basic writing advice from some random Scott. But here we go. So I think a lot of times the basic stuff, uh, we sort of blow past it sometimes. Um, I, I teach drum kit and percussion for one of my real jobs. And um, a lot of the time with the basic uh, stuff in there, you forget about it and then um, it all goes kind of wrong. So I think we need to remember the, the basic stuff quite a lot. For example, show don't tell is something I always think, yeah, I've conquered that. I came forced in NYC midnight. I've, I've conquered that rule. Yeah, there are a lot of people here um, in this room that have read my stuff and who have beta read and who have given me feedback. And I think every single one of you have uh, on multiple occasions said, here you're telling me you're not showing. Um, so, the, But the one I want to talk about is um, write what you know. Um, because this one, I, I was against this advice at first, but I was in primary school. I was quite young. So in primary school, um, I was really into my writing uh, and I had some really, really good uh, teachers in primary school. And they um, were really encouraging uh, of my writing. Uh, and I remember that we um, had that chat. What do you want to be when you when you grow up? And about 12 people said they wanted to be a vet. One person said he wanted to be an astronaut. I don't know how he got on. I don't think there's any famous Scottish astronauts yet. Um, and I I didn't say I wanted to be, I said I was going to be an author. Um, and uh, the teacher was very encouraging of that. 
And we were talking about creative writing and the teacher had said that you have to write what you know. And I hated that, hated that idea because my, one of my heroes um, growing up was R.L. Stang. And I wanted to write like him. I wanted to write about monsters and ghosts and ghouls. And I've never met a monster or a ghost or a ghoul, or maybe I have. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I didn't understand that advice because I think everything you write comes from truth in some way. I'm going to give you a wee quote here. And we're in the James Joyce Centre. It should probably be a James Joyce quote, or maybe even um, because I'm from Scotland, it could be a, a Rabbi Burns quote. But no, this is a quote from Doctor Who. Best TV show. Um, so there's a scene in a Doctor Who episode where the Doctor is speaking to um, a young lady and he's telling her a story. And she stops him and says, hang on, is this, uh, a, is it, is this something that really happened or is it just a story? And he says, and I love it, every story ever told really happened. I love that quote. It's a really good quote. And I thought at the time, that's just poetry. It's just a, you know, poetic and it's not, like, it's not real. Lord of the Rings didn't really happen. But I think um, there's some truth to it. I think the um, write what you know comes into everything that we write. So the first piece of writing I'm going to talk about of mine, where write what you know is quite apparent, um, was my first ever contest win. So let's hear pause for applause contest. Um, so yeah, I did actually win a contest once as well. About a year ago, um, I won a, a contest uh, for writing magazine and it was published um, last year. Um, it was a, just a short 500 words uh, piece of flash and um, it was based uh, completely on a, a real life uh, situation. So I, um, this begins um, in the year 2020, it should be thunder or something when we say 2020, it was a bad year. Um, so obviously there was a big thing you might have heard of called um, a global pandemic and uh, that sort of stopped my life in its tracks for a little bit. Um, so I mentioned I teach drum kit and percussion. I was doing that um, full time before uh, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was doing that privately and uh, I had quite a big timetable uh, and then obviously COVID hit and I had about 15 pupils left uh, and I had to teach them on Zoom, which was not fun. The Zoom cuts out loud noises. How are we meant to do that to a drummer? Um, <laughs> but uh, so there was a lot of other stresses going on in my life at the time as well. Uh, and But the biggest stress was the, the job situation because I didn't know where, how long COVID was going to last um, and how long I could go without really been paid very much so I looked for other jobs and I found one um I a support for learning assistant in a high school uh which I thought was only going to be temporary but I'm still there but I really enjoy it it's not the kind of thing that um I thought I would do but uh but I'm doing it and it's and it's good it's challenging uh but it's but it's great uh when I started there um I was told that my job was uh, specifically for one pupil I didn't, I was naive about this job before I started. I didn't know that that even happens, that you would have one member of staff to one uh, pupil. Um, and all, all I was told about him was he had missed half of his education up to this point. Um, so he'd missed half of primary school and he's just starting high school um, in his first year. Uh, and his life had been, as you can imagine, quite... Um, Involves three acts. Oh, you, speaking. before you ever start editing need to be able to look at your story and say, here is the setup. I don't know if I Here's the end of Act 1, here's the beginning of Act 2. Sorry, Chris, can you just, you're in control in there. Can you just uh, mute that person? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> I think we're all good. <laughs> Where was I? So, yeah, I started, started at the school and um, I was working with a boy. Um, I'm going to call him John, not his real name. Um, mm -hmm. So I was, I was uh, working with this boy, John. And uh, his behaviour was was really, really challenging. Um, so my job was to kind of make sure that he stayed out of trouble as much as possible. And because he had gaps in his education, to obviously be there for him and um, try and work with him to, to get through um, at least his first year in high school. Um, it was tremendously challenging. Um, he was involved in everything you can think that you, that you could be involved in high school. Um, he got himself in trouble every five minutes, probably. Uh, and it, there were times where he purposefully was trying to get himself in trouble because his, his mission was to get excluded from the school. In fact, not, not excluded, but expelled from the school because he just didn't want to be there. Um, so there was one day in particular where just everything you can imagine, um, he, he, he did it. Uh, he beat up another student. Uh, he shouted and swore at teachers. He walked out of classes early. I had to chase him. I, had a, I think I ran about 
26 miles marathon um, around the school um, chasing after him. And uh, he even set the fire alarm off that day, denied it, and we found him on CCTV. Um, and it was a tremendously, tremendously challenging day, and I was exhausted. Uh, and the next day, um, I went to see one of the deputies at the school, um, who's an Irishman, by the way, but I, can't, I don't know where from Ireland he's from. I'll find out. Um, but uh, yeah, he told me that he had phoned John's um, step uh, uh, foster father, uh, and the foster father said that John had got into the car that day and he put the seatbelt on and uh, they started driving and the foster father asked him, so how was your day? And John burst out crying. Uh, and I was baffled. I was like, what, what do you mean he burst out crying? Like, like he'd, he'd done all that bad behaviour the day before. He had a smile on his face as he was doing it. Should be me that's crying. Um, but I was floored by this. We were both quite, um, uh, quite stunned by it. But we found out more about John's life. Um, and obviously, for obvious reasons, I can't tell you all about that. But um, even the things I can tell you and the things I know, I think are just a fraction of what social work would have known. Um, and that is just a fraction of probably what was actually going on at the time as well. Um, so John was the oldest of um, four siblings um, and they uh, lived with their dads. The mum wasn't in the life. Uh, the dad was in and out of jail. Um, there was a lot of drugs and violent incidents um, involved and uh, he was eventually fostered. And I was naive and probably still a bit naive about how, how fostering works. I didn't realise that um, a lot of the time when children are fostered, they're, they're taken away from the city um, that they uh, that they lived in um, because their family is just problematic. Um, so, yeah, John and his oldest sister were fostered uh, in Dundee, where I'm from, and his two youngest were fostered in a different city. Um, they lived in pretty bad poverty. Um, and because John was the, the only boy, his dad sort of drove this um, thing into him that he was supposed to be a man, he was supposed to be tough, um, he was supposed to start fights with people. Um, and it, he actually paid um, other boys in the playgrounds to fight John, um, which is just ridiculous, obviously. Um, and so, but John had this, it, all this stuff going on whilst he was going to high school. And, Starting high school is a traumatic time for anybody, I think, um, let alone just having all that going on. So I came to realise that I didn't really know John all that well, even though I was probably, for two, the two years that I worked with him, um, I was the one that was the most constant in his life at that time. Um, he was he moved from one foster family to another one in a different town, about half an hour drive away from Dundee. Then he moved to another one. Um, he had different teachers, obviously, coming in and out of, of classrooms and out of his life. And uh, he did see his dad, but he only seen his dad once every two weeks. So it was chaotic. And um, I was the one that he seen five days a week, which I, I've no idea how I got into that position. I have no expertise in um, support for learning. Maybe a little bit more now, but yeah. Um, but I came, came to realise I don't, I didn't know what was going on in John's head. Um I'll probably never know because I I had um, a problematic parent growing up and not the perfect uh, childhood, but it was paradise compared to to John's. Um, so I wrote a piece called "See Me," which was from John's point of view, and it's a fictionalized version of John, uh, and it was just an attempt to kind of understand what was going on um, in John's head, uh, and it responded well with the judges and it won um, and I think that's because it was real it was a real piece of writing um, at least as far as I could um, guess at what John was feeling so I think that's where right what you know comes in um, directly uh, handy but there's another piece of writing where right what you know was really in there but I didn't realize it at the time I didn't write it thinking this is my life um, I, but it was uh, after I've analysed it um, for, for this talk today. So I wrote a, a novella called Joy's Lament, which is available on Amazon, <laughs> written by a writer who came fourth place in NYC Midnight. 6,000 people. <laughs> um, but this one, I, I, I it's my favourite thing that I've written, but it's not the best thing I've written. Um, if I could write it again, I'd do a million things differently. Um, I pick up a, a, a sort of part of Joy's Lament now and I read it and it's um, 
it's fine, but I would do a million things differently, which we probably all do that. We'll probably all pick up old pieces of writing and see where, where we've gone, not necessarily wrong, but we've done things that we wouldn't do now. Um, but I wrote this um, over a few months in uh, 2021, and maybe a lot of you can uh, relate to this. Whenever you write um, a, a bigger piece um, of fiction, it's quite often an idea that's sort of been living in your head um, for a long time. I, I had that with a couple of other things that I've written. I've just been like, I've imagined the story. And I think it's because there's things happening in your life at the time um, that make you want to write that particular story. With Joy's Lament, it kind of felt like it, it came together really quickly and I just wanted to, to um, write it and get it out there. Um, so it's a sort of sci-fi slash fantasy story um, about a universe where um, happiness is fading and everybody's getting all sad and miserable. Uh, and it's a little bit inspired by uh, A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens. I read A Christmas Carol most years. I love it. I'll tell you one of the reasons that, that I wanted to read A Christmas Carol. Every version I've seen, every every film version, <laughs> there's um, there's always this scene where somebody whispers, uh, oh, sorry, Scrooge whispers into the charity person's uh, ear at the end how much he wants to donate and like how much and I always want to know how much it was <laughs> has anyone read a Christmas Carol <laughs> still don't find out how much it was <laughs> disappointing <laughs> still read it every year maybe it'll, maybe it'll change maybe we'll find out how much it was um but yeah it's, it's a great book and I wanted my book to be a little bit like a Christmas Carol um, so it was written in five chapters, uh, like a Christmas card, and I wanted it to be sort of a similar length, and ended up being a little bit longer, because um, I just can't shut up sometimes when I start speaking, but I will shut up very soon. Um, so yeah, I, I've went off on the tangent, I've forgotten where I am. Um, so yeah, the universe is getting sad, um, and nobody knows why it's happening. Um, and there's a young lady, she's only 19 years old, and she thinks she's found out where it's come from. Uh, and she steals a spaceship, very Doctor Who style, um, and uh, she goes to a planet where um, she thinks the source of all this sadness and misery has come from. Uh, and when she gets there, she discovers this thing called Christmas. Um, so she doesn't have Christmas on her planet, but they have Christmas here. And um, she doesn't know what it is, but she sees like sort of frozen um, Christmas trees, uh, decorations with icicles hanging down from them. And she doesn't meet very many people. Um, but the people she does meet are starting to forget what Christmas is. Um, I'm not religious, but I celebrate Christmas like like most people. Um, I have a young daughter, um, nine years old, and um, we try and always make Christmas special. Um, but most of the time, I, so I'm, I'm a single dad. Um, so when I have my daughter for Christmas, it's just me and her. Um, and that can be kind of enormous pressure. Um, as a single parent, because I feel like I've got to deliver. Because I have such like special memories of Christmas um, being a child, and I want my child to have nice special memories as well. Um, so in 2021, I had just had uh, the year before my first Christmas with just me and, and my daughter. And uh, yeah, it was, it was filled with pressure. Um, and then that Christmas, uh, but because of whatever things going on in life, I was facing maybe having my first Christmas just by myself, which is fine. Um, it's actually less pressure than um, having to to um, do just just Christmas for my, my daughter. Um, and all that was obviously kind of going on in my head when I wrote Joy's Men. And I just thought it was a kind of tribute to A Christmas Carol. Um, and it is a, a bit of a tribute to A Christmas Carol, but it also reflects um, what I thought was kind of happening in my life, where Christmas was kind of disappearing. It was freezing over. I wasn't ever going to have a Christmas um, as special as, as the ones that I had when I was a child. Um, in the, the book, there's a character called Lothar who has um, a daughter who's the same age as my daughter. And of course, it's just reflected how I uh, sort of feared that um, my life might have kind of went with... Um, me and my daughter, where they're sort of um, growing apart a little bit. Safe, uh, proud to say that we've not grown apart, we're getting closer. Um, but these things are always fear. And I think um, we always write about fears. Um, so Deidre mentions um, about uh, death um, uh, in the tarot cards. There's um, a theory I heard, probably familiar with, about how all fiction um, is really about death. And it can be death in a, a, a literal sense, or it can be the death of uh, something, the end of a relationship, um, the end of Christmas, um, that sort of thing. Um, so that's where Joy's Lament really came from. And I didn't really uh, admit that to myself at the time. I just thought I was writing a fun little story. Well, it wasn't fun, it was quite depressing. It was fun in the end, spoilers. 
Uh, but I really enjoyed writing it and I, I felt um, a, a really deep connection with it. And like I say, I don't think it's the best thing I've ever written. It's not better than my fourth place entry from in my set. <laughs> Did I mention that? <laughs> um, I, but it's it's something that I feel really connected to. And I didn't really understand that until um, I was preparing for this talk. So thank you, Deidre, for the opportunity um, to, to uh, kind of delve into that for this talk. Um, and I think if I had really realized where those themes were coming from at the time, I could have really um, dug into it and really described how I felt at the time and really put that into uh, to the book. And it would have been stronger. Not that it's not already strong, it's, it's pretty good. Read it for yourself, it's on Amazon. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's where I think um, it all came from. And I think if, uh, if my, my lesson to myself is to, um, to listen to, to where, to, to why um, I'm feeling particularly uh, compelled to write something at the time. And it probably is because of something that's happening in life. Um, I think it probably always is the case. And I think if we pay attention to that connection and that voice, um, then our writing will be uh, a lot stronger. Um, that's all I have to say. Okay.